Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, my name is Doris Sommer. I'm the director of the Cultural Agents Initiative at Harvard University. And uh, it's my pleasure to come and talk to you today about Renaissance Now. Why is the Renaissance important? Uh, we know that the Renaissance was a response to um, the plague. Uh, here we are coming out of a plague and uh, with many interesting initiatives and we don't know each other yet. So what we're doing is writing cases for culture, which look like business school cases. In fact, they are business school cases, many of them, uh, that give account of the constructive effects, of the collaborations between artists and practical people, including entrepreneurs and politicians. And with those cases for culture, we offer a certificate program for cities, not for individuals, but for entire cabinets, so that collaboration becomes a, um, a platform, uh, a, a beginning point, not a, uh, a conclusion for the certificate. We begin by getting out of silos and learning about what arts, participatory arts, do for policy. Uh, so welcome to the Arts and Policy City certificate. Why do we call this Renaissance? Uh, because as you know, the Renaissance was a response to the plague. Uh, Europe came out of the plague and uh, intellectuals and artists came out of the cloisters to put the human being in the center of their work, no longer God. So that's the beginning of humanism. And uh, artists, bankers, businessmen, politicians collaborated. They uh, each got their hands a little dirty and risky in different ways, but they launched uh, a, uh, a collaboration which inspires us still today. And here you see the Duomo in Florence, which looked like uh, a mistake to everyone else, but the Medici's who actually trusted their artist friend, their very young architect friend, Brunelleschi. And because the Medici's took uh, a good risk, uh, the Florentines could trust their judgment. And judgment is the key term. Here we are with, uh, not with El Duomo, but with um, a billboard that produces potable water in Lima, with uh, one of the many towers now around Europe that suck in contaminated air and produce pebbles, sometimes for uh, very charming uh, jewelry. These are uh, initiatives that we should recognize as part of a platform that we can pull together and call Renaissance Now. So what is it uh, that links us to politics, not only to economics and environment? Uh, here's a very early vision of what the humanities are, what humanism is. Uh, it's from 1339 in Siena. There's actually a palazzo publico, a um, a palace dedicated to civics. And among the important murals here uh, is justice. Justice is the center. It's not God. It's not the Virgin Mary uh, because uh, justice needs art because art is the process of making something new. It's not the product. A work of art means it's the result of the process. And without art, there's nothing new. There's no entrepreneurship and no enchantment. Uh, Max Weber was very worried about losing enchantment in the world. Art revives our enchantment and our love for the world. If we don't love it, we don't care for it. Care for should be understood in both ways, meaning both to love and to be responsible for. Okay, so that's what art is good for, for making new things. What about the humanities? What good are the humanities? And lots of academics and students ask themselves that now. But look, uh, all of the 21st century skills are humanistic skills. Think about it. STEM keeps looking for these skills. Their creativity, critical thinking, collaboration, communication. All of these are humanistic skills. And what do they lead toward? Towards developing our innate faculty, which needs some exercise of disinterested judgment. Disinterested judgment is what we need to be good political leaders. If we are only uh, motivated by our interests, by our existing desires, how do we become ethical? 
how do we become inclusive? And aesthetics is the training ground for disinterest and for disinterested judgment. That's why Kant um, took aesthetics seriously. Now, here's a combination, uh, recent, uh, not contemporary, but recent combination of art and politics. This is Bogota, Colombia in 1995. It was the most chaotic, critical, uh, corrupt, violent city in the Americas, maybe in the world. And what did the new mayor, Mayor Antanas Mokus do? He was desperate for the first month. Uh, his secretary of culture says, there's nothing to do boss, but to bring out the clown. And Mokus decided not to be offended, but to say, that's a good idea, let's try it. So he put 20 pantomime artists on the streets to replace 20 corrupt traffic cops. So instead of getting paid off for a ticket, uh, uh, pedestrians were, uh, were alert to the, the mimes because they didn't want to be embarrassed. A mime could make everyone laugh at a, uh, across a Jake Walker uh, or someone who, um, who didn't stop at, uh, at a red light. And here's one of the mimes saying, incorrecto, in front of a big bus. That was Mokus, and it broke the ice in Bogota. People started to look at each other, to pay attention to one another, to self-regulate and mutually regulate. Uh, here's a variation of that. A crosswalk in Spanish is called a zebra, for obvious reasons. And when the novelty of the mimes wore off, because art is always surprise, art is always enchantment, and when you get used to it, it doesn't work anymore. That's why you have to keep creating it. And so what did they do in La Paz, Bolivia? They dressed their traffic cops as zebras and people crossed with the zebra in both senses, delighted. Here's another variation also with the traffic um, uh, challenge. In, um, in El Paso, Texas, uh, a councilman uh, who was voted into city council because he's a good artist, uh, made a project called uh, the El Paso Transnational Trolley. This was a trolley that actually ran back and forth from El Paso to Ciudad Juarez a um, hundred years ago. And uh, his slogan is make the border safe again, not make America great again. Uh, people laughed at him. They said impossible to revive hundred year old trolleys that are all rusted out, but look what he did. And with these revived trolleys, bleak and beautiful and historically relevant, the center of El Paso began to live again, economically, socially, politically. Uh, hotels started making money to refurbish. Tourists started coming back. And, uh, and El Paso is a thriving city center now, thanks to artist Peter Schwarzbein. Many of you already know the wonders that Eddie Rama did in, um, in Tirana, Albania. He came back in the year 2000 to bury his father. That was a, a funeral uh, that brought him back from Paris. He was a good painter, lived very well in Paris. And uh, his friend said, no, you have to run for mayor uh, because the city is falling apart. So with, uh, with just a little bit of money, he bought garish colors of paint and got residents of boring gray buildings to paint their buildings in designs that, uh, that he offered them. Uh, and um, here is Tirana going forward. And many of you know or may want to know this case. Uh, Eddie Rama is now not mayor of Tirana, but prime minister of the country as a painter. Here we are back in Bogota. I, I want to uh, stay here for a while. Uh, Antanas Mokos is a, a friend now and a colleague. Uh, and because everyone uh, flocks to him, uh, because he takes good ideas. Uh, I and uh, lots of artists come to him. This one came with an idea that we should paint fleeting stars on the streets of Bogota everywhere a, um, a pedestrian was killed in a traffic accident. So this fleeting star in the colors of, uh, of uh, a police accident uh, area uh, also looks like a cross. And when one star gets painted on top of another, on top of another, you know 
that it's dangerous to walk in the streets and you pay attention to the crosswalks, to the red lights. Here's another project that a different artist brought with a, uh, a large format card that Mokos distributed to 40,000 residents of the center of Bogota. Uh, one thumb up when you pass someone in the street, either by car or walking, uh, and that person is polite and gives you uh, the right of way, and thumbs down when they're rude and, uh, and dangerous. Here's Mokos, another artist dressed in a super civico. And uh, a week of going to work in this outfit uh, made one uh, woman stop him on the street and say, Mayor Mokos, thank you. We got the joke. Now wear something decent uh, to, to go to work. Uh, art doesn't stay as an effect. Uh, art, as I say, refreshes, it surprises. And, um, and people who say it doesn't work because uh, it wears off uh, are like people who may think that food doesn't work because you eat one day and you can be hungry the next. You have to keep eating. It's part of a system. You have to keep making art. Look at the results of making art in Bogota. The red line is the rate of homicide in the city. In 1995, when Mokos came to office, it was at its very highest. And within 10 years, it had reduced by 70%. I'm a humanist. I don't do uh, graphs of numbers, but I'm uh, entirely persuaded that statistical graphs are important if we want to show how art works and why it's important and why we need cases for culture and certificates to alert uh, decision makers about the power of uh, participatory arts. Here's another graph that's just as eloquent, um, I think. Uh, Revenues to the city increased by 300%, threefold, because everyone knew that Mokos was not corrupt. He couldn't steal money. And the money that he uh, brought in uh, was used for infra infrastructure. He built uh, roads and um, a city bus system called the Transmilenio and schools and, um, and civic centers uh, and the city started to breathe again and become even a tourist destination after so many years of, uh, of blight, of social blight. Now, here's another uh, example I just want to share with you because I know Kopi Ruiz, uh, the artist here on the left side. He and hundreds of artisans in Paraguay are preparing for the Pope's visit in 2015 by making an altar from local produce, from corn and beans. Look at the altar they put together. All over the country, people were putting pieces of this altar together and it took 10 big trucks to bring the pieces together in Asuncion uh, so that Pope Francisco could uh, deliver mass in the capital city to throngs of loving, uh, devotees and uh, coming uh, to to this mass in procession with candles, with uh, song, uh, was part of the installation uh, and part of the uh, productivity of participatory art. There was no crime. Uh, there were no teenage pregnancies. Uh, there was no hatred, uh, but love. Uh, I can show you uh, more from Paraguay when we have when we have a chance. But um, right now, I want to show you uh, some of the theoretical background for a simple uh, process like this certificate program. Uh, I talked about judgment before, and this comes from Immanuel Kant. He is the theorist of um, the Enlightenment. Everybody would ask him, what's the Enlightenment? So he finally wrote an essay called, What is the Enlightenment? And uh, you should read it if you haven't. But he distinguishes between two kinds of judgment. One is determinant judgment, where you have rules. You have rules from nature. Uh, that's in his first critique of pure reason. And then uh, the second critique of practical reason is about social laws. These are laws that you don't discover as you do with natural science. They're laws that you make, that you promulgate so that you can live in uh, moral, uh, ethical, social, 
uh, system. What happens with uh, aesthetics? Aesthetics has no laws. It has no pre-existing rules. There, your judgment is not determinate. It's free. When you see something new, when you see something uh, that surprises you, you have no pre-existing concepts for how to judge it. You're floating. You're thrilled. It's art. It surprised you. It delights you. But you don't know what to make of it. You don't know if it's beautiful or not, useful uh, aesthetically uh, or not, uh, because use is, uh, is bracketed here. Uh, is it beautiful or is it not? And because you're floating, you have to ask other people after you've made a hunch, what do you think? What do you think? And asking other people makes the subjective hunch it almost immediately intersubjective, and it sets the ground for sociability, sociability among equals, because your hunch is no more valuable than someone else's hunch. And the idea is to come to an agreement this is a, a training ground to come to agreement, but you cannot force an agreement. There's only an ought in aesthetic judgments, and it's pronounced conditionally. We are suitors for agreement. I mean, Kant has such a dry style, and for him to use this kind of playful, erotic language, we are suitors for agreement, uh, is uh, a way to talk about politics as the ground for persuasion for conversation, uh, for coming to a common sense, a sensus communis, which is not common sense is not what you already know for Kant. He resignifies that. And uh, for him and now for us, it means the sense that we have in common because we made it together. Uh, and just following up a little with Kant, uh, surprise is the uh, trigger for knowing anything. So if you're working in the public sphere and you already know what to do, you already know the concepts, you haven't learned anything, you haven't risked anything, you haven't um, exposed yourself to the world to care for it. So uh, his lesson for learning anything is to be able to discover it, to open yourself up to surprise. And um, that means that there's no perfection because if you would think in terms of perfection, you already know what you're looking for. You already know that you want a skyscraper or uh, a three uh, lane highway before you consider the options, before you uh, uh, are exposed to surprise, before you ask people, what do you think? What do you think? So uh, there's no perfection in aesthetics. The idea of perfection kills the necessity for judgment. Uh, that's a, um, something that we take away uh, from Kant. And so because you're not driven by your interests and you're not driven by your desires, which would also mean uh, something that you know, uh, you can be cool. You can uh, step away from that thrill that you got and say, what do I think? And because you can be cool and disinterested, uh, you can have the ambition to be an ethical and inclusive uh, political figure. Now, Viktor Shklovsky uh, is one of our favorite uh, aesthetic theorists. He wrote a very short essay, 10 pages, that uh, everyone likes to read because it's um, funny and, uh, and very clever. And he says, look, a lot of people tell you that art is great, uh, that poetry is great because it thinks in images or it deals in universal themes and it has an economy of expression. All of this is ridiculous, he says. Uh, you don't think in images. Uh, that's uh, what maybe what painters do. And universal themes, who doesn't have a universal theme? That's the definition of universal. What makes art different from just everyday talk? An economy of expression? On the contrary. What art does is, is prolong perception. It makes things difficult. It makes you stop at them. You don't know what you're looking at. Even things that were familiar yesterday have a new light and you say, oh my God, I didn't notice. And if you don't have that, oh my God, I didn't notice moment, you're living in a world of habit and habit has no surprises and habit has no enchantment and no caring for the world. 
Uh, so when he says that habitualization devours everything and, and escalates, uh, my work, clothes, furniture, my wife, and the fear of war, look at that escalation. Uh, he wants uh, to invite us to do and to respond to art because it breaks habit. Schiller, who was an uh, early disciple of Kant, uh, was in the same line. And, uh, and therefore, he wrote on aesthetic education when? When the terror broke out in the French Revolution. Everyone else was looking at the terror and trying to figure out a political solution, a reasonable solution. And he said, no, reason would make you respond to terror with more terror, violence with more violence. They're wrong, therefore I cut off more heads. He says the way to respond to violence is with a surprise with art, because the enemy will say, what's that? Tell me, talk to me. And it's that stop, that going off on a tangent uh, that can get us out of the spiral of violence with more violence. And we can all make that sidestep because along with the drives to reason on one side and to passion on the other side, we have a third drive that he names. He says, we all have it, but we never name it. And he calls that the Spieltrieb. Here's a scene of that terror that he's responding to. And here's the Spieltrieb, the play drive. He says, we all have a, uh, a tendency, a faculty, a drive, a joy in making new things and playing. So instead of the uh, barbaric reason, barbarism is what he calls reason when uh, when Walter Benjamin says that the history of humanity is the history of barbarism, that's what he means. He's using a Schillerian uh, word for barbarism. It means cold, uh, heartless reason. And passion on the other side is savage. It has no values, no rules. Uh, but play is a third, uh, a third faculty, a third drive uh, that will save us from the civil war, even in ourselves, between reason and passion. So here, here I am. Um, you can read more about Schiller. Uh, here I am, since the play drive is an obligation to be creative. Uh, here I have my only work of conceptual art, making from protest a proposal from protesta to propuesta, because we know what the protests are, we know what's wrong, but just to say what's wrong and ask someone else to fix it uh, is lazy, uh, is irresponsible and doesn't take advantage of our Spieltrieb. So we make proposals and my proposal, uh, as uh, some people know, is uh, an education proposal, which I would like to uh, leave with you too, along with the uh, Certificate for Art and Policy. Uh, this is the pedagogy uh, behind the certificate and also a pedagogy that we can install in all educational environments, in schools from K to graduate school, in civic centers and museums and libraries. And we're doing it in many places in the world. I hope we'll do it with you as well. And again, I thank you so much for your attention and look forward to conversations with you. Thank you.